Tonight on the John Ankerberg Show, we will compare the beliefs of Orthodox Christianity with the beliefs of the United Pentecostal Church International. But, uh, I defined United Pentecostalism as the Pentecostals initially had as a cult and uh, did not consider it to be Christian theology, particularly relative to the Trinity, the person and nature of our Lord, and uh, their doctrine on baptism and speaking in tongues. We do not believe that the terms Trinity, God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, the Eternal Son, the first, second, third persons in the Trinity are either scriptural nor correct. We believe the doctrine of the Trinity was a product of pagan mythology and Grecian philosophy. And since this particular issue is pertinent to virtually every Christian sect and denomination, I think this discussion should be of great value to everybody. The United Pentecostal Church sets itself up as the judge of all churches. It maintains that unless you are baptized in the name of Jesus, you are baptized by immersion, you speak in tongues as evidence, uh, initial evidence of salvation, and you, and, you don't, and you reject the Christian doctrine of the Trinity in favor of the oneness doctrine, you are going to hell. Why didn't the Jews pick it up? Why didn't they worship a God in Trinity? Why were they so monotheistic and were they a cult? I agree that not being baptized, if you know that you're supposed to be baptized, if you've ever been told to, sin. not being baptized is a sin. It is not the unforgivable sin. That's all and the believe. presence of the Holy Spirit in a person is proof positive that he is saved. Romans chapter 8. But you can't separate baptism from the baptism of the Holy Ghost and baptism in water in Acts 10. The main thing is, people who are listening, people who see this for the first time, in the entire history of media are going to understand why you believe what you believe. That's worth its weight in gold because you haven't had that chance ever. Representing the denomination of the United Pentecostal Church International will be Dr. Nathaniel Urshan, the general superintendent and one of the main speakers for their Harvest Time radio broadcast. Also, Mr. Robert Sabin, President and Professor of Apostolic Bible Institute of St. Paul, Minnesota. Representing Orthodox Christian belief will be Dr. Walter Martin, Director of the Christian Research Institute of California, and Mr. Calvin Beisner, Editor of Discipleship Journal and author of the book, God in Three Persons. Please join us. Gentlemen, we're all glad that you're here tonight. And I think that what we want to do in examining the nature of God, because this is where we differ, is that I would like for you to start us off, both sides, by giving us a standard definition that we can all start with to know where you're coming from. And uh, Walter, I'm going to ask that you would start. Yeah, I would define the doctrine of the Trinity classically as within the nature of the one eternal God, there are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, without getting into great detail, that would be in essence uh, what it is. Okay, Cal? The uh, great Presbyterian theologian at the turn of the century, Dr. Benjamin Breckenridge Warfield, uh, pointed out that when we say these three things, that there is but one God, that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is each God, and that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is each a distinct person, then we have enunciated the doctrine of the Trinity in its completeness. Now, the, the need for a definition is crucial in a debate like this because it defines the parameters of the debate. What happens typically when you debate the doctrine of the Trinity with various different people, no matter what position they're coming from, is that they end up arguing on things that it turns out you agree on. This approach, this definition that B.B. Warfield has given, which is entirely in accord with all the great creeds of the church ever since before Nicaea, as a matter of fact, uh, this definition makes clear that there are two very important points on which we in the United Pentecostal Church are totally agreed, namely that there is but one God and that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is each God. The disagreement comes entirely at the third point that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are distinct persons. And that's where the debate needs to center. Okay, thanks, Cal. Nathaniel? We do not believe in a three-person trinity. We believe that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. We do not believe that the terms trinity, God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, the eternal Son, the 
first, second, third persons in the Trinity are either scriptural nor correct. We believe the doctrine of the Trinity was a product of pagan mythology and Grecian philosophy. And since this particular issue is pertinent to virtually every Christian sect and denomination, I think this discussion should be of great value to everybody. Okay, Daniel, thank you. Bob? Well, it's interesting that <clears throat> this should center on our being called a cult. We're being called a cult because we believe in the faith of Abraham, and others are orthodox because they believe in the faith of Nicaea. We believe that Jesus Christ was the mighty God manifest in the flesh. We believe there is a one divine person who has uh, manifested himself as creator and father and as the Lord Jesus Christ and as the Spirit of God in the earth today for believers. Okay, let's see how this actually works out. Take your Bibles if you would and let's take a look at Scripture here. And a uh, classic one that I think everybody in the audience would expect us to look at is John 1, 1, 2, and 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Uh, verse 14, the Word became flesh and lived for a while among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Uh, Nathaniel, how would you interpret that in light of the fact that it seems and Obviously, traditional Christianity uh, has looked at this and said that here is a, a classic example of two persons. You're talking about John 1.1. 1, 1. Yes. I would interpret that as the fact that in the beginning, the word, the logos, uh -huh. was in the mind and the concept of God and was not a person, but in the plan and the mind of Almighty God for a future manifestation. Okay. Dr. Martin, how would you respond to that same verse? Well, uh, the preposition pros, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God, literally, is face to face with. And you can't be face to face with uh, mere concept or abstraction. You have to be face to face with person. And uh, the word was face to face with God. The word was God. And then verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. If you cross-reference that with uh, 1 John, you find very quickly that we have handled, we have seen, we have heard uh, the Word of life. And this life was with the Father. And again, you have the preposition with, that is uh, standing in opposition to the Father. And the prepositions alone uh, would indicate uh, an individual. You could even argue for the divinity of mankind eternally based upon John chapter 1 if you took uh, Brother Urshanson's position because we existed in the mind of God also. Therefore, we are as eternal as Jesus Christ. And that type of logic will just simply defeat you when you try and exegete a passage. Bob? Well, it's uh, interesting that he should say that, you know, that the word was with God would indicate that it had to be face to face with God. Job said with him were wisdom and power. And yet, the wisdom and power are not persons in the Godhead. They're not uh, persons. And so, uh, but Bob, but, let me ask you a question yeah. at that point. Does it say anywhere that the wisdom became, became flesh and dwelt among us? I believe that Jesus was the wisdom of God. Uh, Dr. Martin mentioned that uh, <clears throat> they handled the word of life. What they handled was the flesh of Jesus Christ, and that flesh of Jesus Christ was not with God in the beginning. Okay, but what, what do you make of the fact that something was with God? You're saying that it's impersonal? Well, you, you've said something was with God, and John 1, 1 says that something was with God. But verse what 2 says it? He was there. All right, uh, it doesn't matter. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, what was with God? Was it a collateral person? If so, we fling ourselves right in the face of the entire revelation of the Old Testament, the Shema of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We divide Him into persons, and we say that with God, in the beginning, were collateral persons. When God, throughout the Old Testament, says there was nobody with Him. But do you deny that in verse 2 and 3, He was with God, all things were made by Him? Doesn't that refer back to the Word? It refers back to the Word, but uh, when you say him. All things were made by Him. Things were made by the Word in respect to the fact 
that God spoke the world into existence. They were made by the wor word respect to the fact that uh, all things were made through him, with him in view, with reference to him, on account of him, because of him, that God did all of his creating in the world with Christ in view, with the future manifestation of himself in view. We would not yeah. see, okay. it, 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 if I could just say, yeah, go ahead. it would have been a simple thing for God in the beginning to have solved the controversy by saying, in the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with God. In the beginning was the second person in the Trinity, and the second person in the Trinity was with God. Whatever was back there was with God, not with God the Father, but with God. If it had said that the Word was with God the Father, then we'd have the two persons in the Trinity. But it said the Word was with God, with God. Okay. What, he's, what he's attempting to argue, of course, is that you've got a contradiction when you call the Word a person who is distinct from some other person who is God, and then say that they're the same God. But in fact, he's stuck logically with the same kind of contradiction when he makes the word word refer to some impersonal principle like wisdom or an impersonal characteristic or attribute like wisdom. Because then what we have is the word wisdom, this impersonal attribute, was with God and the word was God, in which case you've got an impersonal attribute which all by its lonesomeness is God. You've got the same logical contradiction in, in terms. The solution to it is to recognize that there is a distinction between a being and a person. And it's, as Aristotle called it, it's, it's a distinction in categories of existence. There are beings, there are persons, there are relations, there are lengths, there are, uh, there are weights, there are all sorts of different categories of existence. Being is one and person is another. The solution to this apparent logical problem if you term the, the word as a person who is coexistent eternally with another person of the Father, is to recognize that it's not logically problematic to say that there are two persons who are the same being. Okay, Bob, we got about uh, 30 seconds. Want to comment? Uh, yes, when you speak of contradictions, how could you have a greater contradiction than to say that there's a person with God in the beginning when God said there isn't one? When God said he's absolutely one, how do you God expressly that? says here that there is a person with him Where because it is that? the word who became flesh and that uses personal pronouns about him. He was in the beginning with God, not it. He was in the beginning with God and that word became flesh, dwelt among us. We, be, we beheld his glory, not its glory. The glory as of the only begotten from the Father. What's the only begotten from the Father if it is not John 1.18? The only begotten God, John 3.16, the only begotten Son. I'm looking for what you said here. You said he was in the beginning with God. My Bible says the same was in the beginning with God. The pronoun isn't introduced until the third verse. You said it, it said well, that, that he was in the beginning. Uh, there, fine, uh, all right. You can, you can use the same if you want to. It happens to be a masculine emphatic pronoun there. In the, in the third verse, it's the masculine regular personal pronoun. And we, either way, the personal pronoun relates to word. But how do you, uh, how do you then reconcile a person, a collateral person, with God in the beginning. You've got two persons, and actually you're going to add a third person yes, before we're through here. And so God says he's absolutely alone. Is. Isaiah 44, 24. I, I, Go ahead, Walter. I, I'd like to think here for a second that uh, it really isn't a question of how you or we reconcile something. It's a question of what the text specifically says. Now, the text says the word was face to face with God. The text says in the masculine pronoun that you have a person, that you are not dealing with an abstract uh, logos of Philo. You are dealing with a person, and you're dealing with a person who became flesh. Now, what interests me is that uh, when you get to the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 1, uh, you are dealing, that's a very good passage to go to, you are dealing with the subject of a dialogue that takes place, which is before the incarnation before the Incarnation, when he was bringing the first begotten into the world, he said, let all the angels of God worship him. And of the Son, he says, talking to the Son, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So if you're going to take the Hebrews passage literally, and we are to interpret literally unless we have reason from the context not to, there was a dialogue going on between somebody who was with God the Father, and that person is addressed by God the Father, 
And that person responds in Hebrews chapter 10. Lo, it is written in the volume of the book, I am coming to do thy will, O God. When? When he was coming into the world. Now, you're not talking incarnation with the human nature of Jesus being the dialogue. You're talking now with a pre-existent personality talking to the Father. Now, you cannot eliminate that personality-wise or grammatically. And I, if you can, I'd like to see how it's going to be done. Let me ask you, is that uh, personality that's talking to the Father the Son, the eternal Son of God? No, there is no such thing as the eternal Son of God. We both agree that the doctrine of the eternal generation of the Son derives from Origen, who was heretical on that point. Then, so we uh, don't have to bother with that. I just want you to tell me how grammatically you are going to escape the force of the fact that before the incarnation there is a dialogue. Now explain the dialogue Excellent. to me. Uh, look at the Bible and tell me if you think that dialogue was before the incarnation from the Father to the Son. Notice uh, that it says here, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Had the Son loved righteousness and hated iniquity before he was born? Obviously, the... Son, the Word, the, one, the Word of God before He came into the world, existing, being divine in nature, could hate and despise everything or love everything that the Father loved. Because right. Now, let me finish. Okay. Now, you asked me the question. I'm okay, answering it for you. Fine. Okay, that's fine. I'll be so, ready for uh, you. Are you, you. You be ready <laughs> as you want. Uh, the point is, this is a grammatical point which says when He is bringing Him into the world, He says, let all the angels of God worship Him. Now, how do you interpret bringing him into the world. When the incarnation, he's a baby, he can hardly talk to him. Let's go back to the first thing you said and answer that. You said that this dialogue that, that Christ in the Old Testament loved righteousness and hated iniquity in eternity. But the Bible says here, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Did the Son of God in eternity before he was born have fellows? And was he anointed in eternity before he was born with the oil of gladness? Or is God speaking prophetically here and not speaking at the time that he brought him into the world? Well, if he's speaking prophetically in the passage, then the grammar is completely wrong. Well, how is he speaking then when he uh, says... You have to explain the grammar to me because I can only go not by a form of argumentation. I'm trying to avoid that. I'm trying to stick to specific grammar. When he is bringing the first begotten into the world, he says. Now, when, he, when he's bringing him in, he says. Now, all I want you to tell me is, what does that mean grammatically to you? It, it doesn't mean anything. Let the angels I, of God I'm worship I'm beginning him. to see that because uh, the text says one thing and you're telling me but, it doesn't matter. It does right, matter. Let's, that was Look, the longest 30 seconds I've ever experienced. And let's, let's take a break and Bob will come back for your answer <laughs> after right. this, okay? You Stick with your life. Us. We'll get that. <laughs> All right, we're back, and we're talking with representatives from the United Pentecostal Church International and uh, representatives of the Orthodox Christian position on the nature of God, namely the Trinity. And, uh, Bob, you need to answer uh, coming back to Walter's questions before the break. I'd be glad to. We have to look at the whole passage. If you notice, it starts at the fourth verse, being made so much better than the angels. That certainly wasn't the eternal Son. That certainly wasn't the second person in the Godhead in the Old Testament. Well, stop saying we'll, we'll keep going. To me I don't no, it. I understand that. Okay. Okay. Being made so much better than the angels obviously tells us at which time this conversation took place. It did not take place uh, as, as you said it took place uh, between two persons in the Old Testament that, times. That cannot be true because look at the passage here below it yes. carefully. Today I have become your father is obviously a point in time referring to the Incarnation. Is that agreed? Uh, the Apostle Paul in Acts 13.33 uh, applied this scripture to the resurrection. But I'm trying to show you that, that it says, from the dead. I'm trying to show you that it says, when he's bringing the first begotten into the world, he says, you are my son, this day have I begotten you. UPC teaches that Jesus, in his human nature, took upon himself a human nature in the Incarnation. Now, you've got to agree here that when it says, you are my son, today I become uh, your father, I will be his father, he will be my son, and then it follows immediately, again, when he brings the first begotten into the world, he says, it is obviously a reference to the incarnation, not to the resurrection. Well, what's, what's the point? I'm going to show you the point. Yeah. Since it's a reference to the incarnation and not the resurrection, when he brings the first begotten into the world, he says, this is before... He actually took human form. 
let all the angels of God worship him, and then he addresses the Son and says, your throne, O God, will last for eternity. You are talking about uh, uh, this, you know, as a matter of fact, this is so clear in the Greek text that when you cross-reference it with Philippians chapter 2, it says, existing, upakon, in the form of God, eternally existing in the form of God. The participle ties you to existing for eternity. Jesus existed in the form of God eternally. Now, there's no way out of Philippians 2 in the Greek. Uh, where does it say eternally in Philippians 2? The participle hupakon. It says eternally. Present, yes, that's a, pre, that's a present. We'll get to Philippians 2, but back to Hebrews. Yo, I, okay, uh, I just well, want I'm to, sure to that, understand what you say. Yeah. Are you saying that as this second person in the Godhead is, is descending to come into this world in, in the human being, Jesus Christ, that it, it's at that time that I the Father am, says that? I am not saying anything. I've when does very, it say? I've been very careful just to quote the text. It says in the text, when he is bringing the first begotten into oikomene, into the inhabited world, that incarnation, any way you spell it, he said to him, you are my son, today have I begotten you. I will be to him a father. It's a change in relationship. The word becomes the son. Uh, I will be to him a father. He will be to me a son. And then he addresses him, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Now, there's no possibility of escaping the impact of the fact that this is a dialogue pre-incarnate. No way out. You cannot have God the Father talking to a baby in a manger and saying to him, thy throne, O God, is for eternity. That's nonsense. Why can't you? Why can't you have God speaking to the baby? He spoke to the Son in, because in all phases of the Old Testament. Because he's not there. Because he is only one person Did the son in your theology. To, sir, so he can't be talking to him. Did the Son have to be there for the Father to speak to the Son, S-O-N? Answer that one. No, wait a second. Re repeat it. I said, did the Son have to be there for the, for the Father to speak to the Son? The S -O -N? text says he was. How about the Old Testament uh, scriptures I would prefer where God to, speaks I would prefer, to the Son? I would prefer to keep to Hebrews before we hop through the Old this, Testament. This is quoting an Old Testament scripture. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd just like to stick with the, what the, the passage this, means this here. This is quoting an Old Testament scripture. Yeah. Okay, I, we need we need 30 second wrap up here because we're just about out of time. So Bob, give us a wrap up. What do you, what do you think it says? All right. I think uh, this is just uh, quoting uh, the prophetic proleptic scriptures of the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God spoke prophetically to the Son, said many things to the Son. The Son did not exist at the time. He didn't come into being until he was born at Bethlehem. And there's no problem there for us. Okay, that God Walter, could speak to this. 30 seconds. But the Word existed. The Word was already there. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh. The Word did exist. We're playing, we're playing word games with the terms Word and Son. You and I agreed the term Son is not applicable, all right? But the term Word is. And the dialogue that goes on is a dialogue between God and the Word. And that's pre-incarnate. And also, when you cross-reference Philippians chapter 2, you are dealing with before time, before Jesus took upon himself a human form, he already existed with the Father. All right, let's, uh, let's wrap it up for this week. If that sounded a little heavy to you, we're going to try another verse next week, okay? And we'll start with uh, John 17, 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. I hope that you'll stick with us, and I think that you'll learn some things. Gentlemen, thank you for this week. Please join us next week. Tonight on The John Ankerberg Show, we will compare the beliefs of Orthodox Christianity with the beliefs of the United Pentecostal Church International. But, uh, I defined United Pentecostalism as the Pentecostals initially had as a cult and uh, did not consider it to be Christian theology, particularly relative to the Trinity, the person and nature of our Lord, and uh, their doctrine on baptism and speaking in tongues. We do not believe that the terms Trinity, God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, the Eternal Son, the first, second, third persons in the Trinity are either scriptural nor correct. We believe the doctrine of the Trinity was a product of pagan mythology 
and Grecian philosophy. And since this particular issue is pertinent to virtually every Christian sect and denomination, I think this discussion should be of great value to everybody. The United Pentecostal Church sets itself up as the judge of all churches. It maintains that unless you are baptized in the name of Jesus, you are baptized by immersion, you speak in tongues as evidence, uh, initial evidence of salvation, and you, and, you don't, and you reject the Christian doctrine of the Trinity in favor of the oneness doctrine, you are going to hell. Why didn't the Jews pick it up? Why didn't they worship a God in Trinity? Why were they so monotheistic and were they a cult? I agree that not being baptized, if you know that you're supposed to be baptized, if you've ever been told to, sin. not being baptized is a sin. It is not the unforgivable sin. That's all and the believe. presence of the Holy Spirit in a person is proof positive that he is saved. Romans chapter 8. But you can't separate baptism from the baptism of the Holy Ghost and baptism in water in Acts 10. The main thing is, people who are listening, people who see this for the first time, in the entire history of media are going to understand why you believe what you believe. That's worth its weight in gold because you haven't had that chance ever. Representing the denomination of the United Pentecostal Church International will be Dr. Nathaniel Urshan, the general superintendent and one of the main speakers for their Harvest Time radio broadcast. Also, Mr. Robert Sabin, President and Professor of Apostolic Bible Institute of St. Paul, Minnesota. Representing Orthodox Christian Belief will be Dr. Walter Martin, Director of the Christian Research Institute of California, and Mr. Calvin Beisner, Editor of Discipleship Journal and author of the book, God in Three Persons. Please join us. Gentlemen, tonight, in talking about this, let's get a quick definition again of the nature of God for people that have just tuned in. And Bob, why don't you start us this week and give us a definition of God as you see it. I believe that God is unalterably one. If there's anything that he said about himself in the Old Testament, it was that he was one. That was never contradicted in the New Testament. We believe that one God was manifest in the flesh. We do not accept the... Uh, creedal definitions of the doctrine of and the Trinity. And when people want to know, when you hear the terms Father or Son or Holy Spirit, they, they see this, what do you do with those? Uh, we believe that, that God, the Creator, was the Father, performed the act of paternity of Jesus Christ, overshadowed the Virgin Mary, and that Jesus was God and man, that He actually inhabited that Christ. Christ was Jehovah, manifest in the flesh. Okay. Uh, Cal, you want to start us this week? Well, <clears throat> the uh, doctrine of the Trinity is that there is but one God, that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is each God, and that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is each a distinct person. And uh, it's very important that we recognize the, the, uh, in, the distinction of, of some words here. He just said that they believe that God is unalterably one. Well, that's fine. So do we. But apparently we have some kind of a disagreement here, and we have to ask the question, one what? He certainly wouldn't believe that God is only one quality, for instance, or one door, or one, I hate to blaspheme and go any farther on something like that, but God is certainly not just one attribute like wisdom or omnipresence or anything like that. He is one being. He has many attributes. But we also believe, as Trinitarians, that God is three persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and that those persons are distinct. Okay, let's jump to the Bible verse here, and gentlemen, let's tackle tonight John chapter 17 and verse 5. John, if, I wonder yes. if we could go back to the Hebrews passage for just a minute. I want to point out two things about it that we were working well, on last week. Okay. Can I? All right, uh, what we have to do is refresh people's minds. We were talking about Hebrews chapter 1, and make the point, uh, give a re encapsulated form of that and then make the point quick. Well, the question is whether Hebrews 1 shows a distinction between the Father and the Son prior to the Incarnation. And you are saying whether that it you does. Call the, I'm saying that it does. Right. And the, the real nut of the question that was going on was a, an argument over whether the Son was properly a, a term for what we would call the second person of the Trinity prior to His Incarnation. I don't think that that would be 
because for two uh, two reasons. Well, for for one reason. Why don't in this you read text, the verse for everybody right? that just tuned in because they don't know what you're okay. talking about, and then give us the point. The verses are uh, verses uh, five, six, and seven of Hebrews one. Go ahead and read it. And eight. I'm sorry. Uh, for to which of the angels did he ever say, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee, and again I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the son, of the son, he says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the, you know, the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Okay, now your point is? Now, there, there are two things in here that make it very clear that this distinction between father and son, though not termed father and son, the personal distinction had to predate the incarnation. The first one is the future tenses in the second half of verse 5. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. This means that they existed prior to this. Second is the preposition into in verse 6, when he brings the firstborn into the world. Now, there are two kinds of prepositions. One kind of preposition, in, on, over, under, on top of, below, describes a static state of being relationship. The other kind of preposition, into, or through, describes an action, describes a motion toward something, all right? Well, you can't move toward something unless you exist before you get to it. So you're saying it shows time the and it hadn't happened yet. Exactly. The sun okay. has to have predated Walter, in some quickly, way, and then we'll get a remark from Bob. Not, Go ahead. Yeah, Bob was saying something before, and I made mention of Hebrews chapter 10, which I wanted to link with Hebrews chapter 1, which I think uh, he would agree there's a linkage. And in Hebrews chapter 10, if you check it in your Bible, you find uh, an interesting observation by the writer. Uh, and the Greek is very strong here. Wherefore, when he comes into the world... What verse? Uh, verse 5. Okay. When he comes into the world, he says... That's very interesting because actually the Greek says, Wherefore, entering into the world. That means he's in the process of entering into the cosmos, into the world. He said... It's not after the incarnation, it's before the incarnation. Sacrifice and offering you would not. A body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Now, from the Greek itself, it was entering into the world when this took place. Before the incarnation, there is a relationship within the Trinity. And there is a conversation going on. There's no way prophetically to escape this. Bob? Uh, if I may say so, uh, I don't want to cross swords with Dr. Martin on the Greek. I believe that the English language is uh, clear enough. I believe enough work has gone into translation that we won't have to uh, appeal to some subtle distinction in the Greek words, although we do not disparage Greek scholarship. but. Uh, if something had to exist for there to be a conversation, in the 22nd Psalm, the Bible speaks of the Messiah as saying, they pierced, past tense, my hands and my feet. I do not see that anything in Hebrews 1 or Hebrews 10, uh, given as spoken by the Son or by the Father, indicates that both had to exist as simultaneous collateral persons in the Old Testament. And then, uh, on top of that, I would like to ask how they're going to solve the can of worms that they've opened up when they have put collateral persons in the Old Testament and all the scriptures in Isaiah plus the Shema absolutely declare that God is one. Now, you can say that that one is a compound one, but it isn't. Let's, let's get one point straight here. <coughs> you say that the English is good enough and we don't want to indulge in subtleties of Greek. When you go around denying the Trinity and calling it pagan, you jolly well better know your Greek, and you don't know it because the passage specifically says when he is bringing him into the world. That's why I went to Hebrews chapter 10. It specifically there puts it in the context of before incarnation. Now, you're welcome to the view you've got, and I'm not going to debate your right to hold it, 
but you cannot hold it against Greek grammar and against the Greek text and then fluff off the Greek and say English is good enough. It wasn't written in English. It was written in Greek in an extremely precise language. And if you're going to deny the Trinity, know your Greek. And if you're going to call a group a cult, know your Bible. I do, very well. You better believe I do. Well, you, you, you show us and where I, 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 Well, I, 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 I'll answer this question categorically right now. When I called you a non-Christian cult, I didn't originate the category. The category came about through the assemblies of God and the Pentecostal churches, which excommunicated your group because they said you were teaching things contrary to the Word of God. And you are right now sitting here talking to me about Trinitarian theology. And when we open up our series of programs, you began by saying, uh, Mr. Urshanson said, that this is pagan mythology. Now, uh, as far as he's concerned, he's entitled to his opinion. But let's get this one thing straight. The United Pentecostal Church sets itself up as the judge of all churches. It maintains that unless you are baptized in the name of Jesus, you are baptized by immersion, you speak in tongues as evidence, uh, initial evidence of salvation, and you, and, you don't, and you reject the Christian doctrine of the Trinity in favor of the oneness doctrine, you are going to hell. Now, that immediately puts you in a position of the papacy before the Middle Ages. You have now gotten rid of every Christian denomination, every Christian scholar, off to hell with the uh, people who don't agree with you, and right down the pike go the Quakers, down the tubes go the Salvation Army, out goes anybody who disagrees with your position, and you don't think that this is cultic behavior? There isn't a scholar in the world that wouldn't classify you as a cult on that basis alone. I want to answer him, please. Hey, Nathaniel. Thank you. Right. We have never said anything about them going to hell. You'll never find that in our writings anywhere. That's not true. Right. I've got your materials, and you are saying that people who do not go through what I just said are lost. Now, where are they lost to? We are saying that the scriptures are the important thing upon where which are they we going? base our con conviction. Where are those people going? God is the judge of man. Oh, come on. Your literature no. says that they're lost. God is the judge of all mankind, and uh, his word will be You're copping out on me. No, let me ask you're you You're going some, against your own literature. Let me ask let you a talk. question. You will. Uh, Isaiah 9, 6. Incontestably declares that Jehovah himself planned to appear in human form. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, all attributes of God alone term mighty is applied to him alone in relation to his deity is in itself indicative of Jehovah since not only is he the only God but the term mighty is applied to him alone. All right, hold on that? to that. Let's take a break right here. We'll come back for a response on Isaiah and uh, we never did get to my verse in John 17 here. Uh, hang in there. <laughs> we'll worry, be right we'll back. All right, we're back, and we're talking with representatives of the United Pentecostal Church International and representatives of the Orthodox Christian belief, uh, especially concerning the Trinity. And let me give a definition here of Trinity, and then, Nathaniel, I want you to come back. Uh, uh, most people will relate to the fact of uh, the doctrine of the Trinity in brief is that there is one God who exists eternally as three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, okay? And uh, you want to jump off from Isaiah chapter 9, and then we'll get a response from uh, Walter or from Cal there. I want to know if uh, Dr. Martin believes that Isaiah 9, 6 incontestably declares that Jehovah himself planned to appear in human form. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, all attributes of God alone. This term mighty is applied to him alone in relation to his deity, is in self indicative of Jehovah, since not only is he the only God, but the term mighty is applied to him alone. Are there two mighty gods? The eternal God, according to Scripture, would make an appearance in flesh. The Jews themselves anticipated this. In fact, at the trial of the Lord Jesus before the Sanhedrin, the interrogation from the Jewish authorities said, Tell us plainly, are you Messiah, Son of the Blessed One? And when Jesus said, yes, they said, what further proof do we have of blasphemy? And they grabbed their, their robes and tore them and so forth. So they understood that God planned miraculously to appear in human flesh. And when Jesus Christ claimed it because he was only a carpenter from Galilee, they want to kill him. And they did. Are there two mighty gods? Let, let me 
respond well, to that? Well, let me ask him the question. It's a straw man argument. Because are there you're asking gods? if there are two mighty gods, and that's a straw man argument because it assumes that the doctrine of the Trinity states something that it doesn't state. Right. What does it state, Cal? We don't state that there, there is are two only one gods. God, that three persons are that same God. Okay. Right. Well, how, how can they be co-equal if they're if they're not uh, if there's not one Almighty well, look, God? I think I, I think let me ask let me first? break in on this one here. Yes. Is that when we ask the questions how? I think at that point, first of all, we find out if the Scripture is saying that. In other words, do we have evidence here for a position one way or the other? Uh, for example, in, in the area of science, I know that uh, back in my uh, physics class, when I examined light, I asked how it could be both wave and particle all afternoon, and I could never figure it out. And the teacher just wanted me to know, what's the evidence show? And I think this is where uh, Walter and Cal are coming from. There's some evidence. And gentlemen, could I get to my verse here? John chapter 17, verse 5 <laughs> might help us out in terms of what do the scriptures say because Nathan, you, you hold to the scripture and so do you, Bob, and so do Cal and Walter. And I want to keep you guys right to the text itself. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Uh, that's 17.8 and 17.18 and 17.5. Uh, Cal, how do you see the evidence from these words of Jesus' own lips? I don't see how anything can be much more clear uh, when he says to the Father, glorify me uh, with the glory that I had with you before the world was. That's talking not just about before the incarnation, but clear back before the creation of sure. anything. And you have two persons named who had glory together. With demands a distinction between the two subjects in the sentence. That's the way prepositions work in language. Uh, I started to say something before about prepositions in a previous uh, dialogue, which was important, and Bob got us into the subject of uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 1 in our dialogue. We never got back to the prepositions, which interests me in John 1, 1 also. Uh, prepositions, I'm quoting now, are used to demonstrate an existing relationship between subject. For instance, a horse and a driver. This relationship is numerical, horse and driver, and designates that more than one subject or object, horse and driver, simultaneously exist. That's prepositions in Greek and in English. Now, in John 17, and in multiple passages of the New Testament, you have prepositions such as this, expressing relationships before the incarnation. Now, in this John chapter, Cal's got a perfect illustration of it in the Greek. Before the world was, I had with you. Now, what's significant to me is, and I close my remark with this and you can respond to it, uh, is this. If I am with you, we, Bob Sabin, Walter Martin, are existing simultaneously. If I'm with you, we're existing simultaneously. Nobody will deny that. Or we are either illusions, pretty big illusions, or one of us is insane because I am talking and there ain't nobody there. Now, I would like you to explain in English, never mind Greek, how you eliminate the concept of preposition in John 17. All right. Uh, first, let me clarify something that you said in the previous session that I was sloughing off the importance of the Greek. I am not. I do not disparage Greek scholarship. I said that in the beginning. Now, if you look at the passage in English, John 17, 5, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Now, back up two verses to John 3, and we see Christ saying, this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God. Has he undeified himself? Or are we talking here about a man, a human being, a human being that says, glorify thou me with the glory with which Sir. this human being, <laughs> Did you wonder which time? this human sure. being sure. had with thee before the world was. Now, Jesus Christ, the human being, did not coexist with God before the world was. But Jesus Christ was foreseen as glorified. And Dr. Martin will tell you that that Jesus Christ is Jehovah God in the flesh. 
Will you not, Dr. Martin? I think, that's, I think that's what we've got to find out. Does the evidence actually say that? Sure. Yeah. Let's take a look at John, John 17, 3. Uh, this is eternal life that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. He says, has Jesus undeified himself? What he's doing is a very simple mistake that every first semester logic student, a student knows about. It's the simple mistake of, of uh, denying the antecedent is what it's called. Illustrated this way. All men are mortal. Fido is not a man, therefore Fido is not mortal. The, the parallel with it is the Father is the only true God. Jesus is not the Father, therefore Jesus is not the only true God. That's not how it works. The only way you could get to that conclusion is if instead you put the word only not before true God, but before Father. Only the Father is the true God. Jesus Christ is not the Father, therefore Jesus Christ is is not God. Now that would be a logically valid argument. But the fact is he's making the same category mistake <coughs> that happens all the time when you forget that being and person are two different types of existence. Okay, and, and Bob, I'd still like you to answer Bob, uh, Walter's question about the prepositions from 17.5 uh, with showing personal Certainly. existence between two entities, two it people? It doesn't necessarily show personal existence between two entities. And if he declares that it shows personal existence between two entities, I, I want him to explain to us the Isaiah scriptures on God being absolutely alone and using personal pronouns, me, I, mine, myself. Those are simple personal English pronouns We've got also. 30 seconds now, what Cal was for a response God? here. Very, very simple done. on those passages. God can speak of himself speaking of his being, or he can speak of himself speaking of his persons. He does it in the singular of his being because he's a single being. He does it in the plural of his persons. Hence, you have the use of plural pronouns in the Old Testament. Genesis 1.26, <clears throat> let us create man in our image. All right. I still haven't got an answer go. on the simple question I asked. Bob Sabin and Walter Martin are with each other. That's right. All right. Now, either there's two of us here or one of us is crazy. You have. Now, I want you to tell me, is right. that true? You have. You, you said that Jesus was Jehovah. Is that right? Jehovah the Son. Jehovah the Son? How many yeah. Jehovahs are there? There's Jehovah the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There's one eternal God. <laughs> now, the problem is, you see, the problem is, if I, if I may, if I may uh, enter this thought here, um, I don't laugh at your position. I disagree with it, but I don't laugh at it. I think you're sincere. I'm supposed to be a pagan, and I've got more courtesy than you have. I'm talking as a Christian to you, although you don't recognize me as a Christian. I'm talking as a Christian to you, and I'm talking on a scholastic level, trying to keep it on that level. I'm not laughing at it. Now, I just want to know, okay. we are together with each other right now. That's true, isn't it? Let me speak to, to both of the things that you said. We do recognize you as a Christian. You don't recognize us as Christians. You said we're outside of the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. Now, we do recognize you as a Christian. According and to you, he believes truth. in a pagan now, God. We don't, we don't <laughs> laugh at you either, you but neither do we say that if you'd use your head, uh, you could reason better than a first semester logic student. We don't talk down to you that way either. Now, now this I, says... I, I didn't finish the... Oh, the but let, let me say what it says. Let, let, and now, O Father, glorify thou me. That's the human being, Jesus Christ, with thine own self. That's the uh, deity of the Old Testament with the glory which I had with thee. Now, in what sense did Jesus Christ the man, the human being that could use the I and the thou, and the, in what sense did Jesus Christ the human being, couldn't. the human being, have glory with God before the he world? He couldn't. Was? How is he speaking here then? Is this he's the speaking, Logos speaking? He's speaking, he's speaking as the God-man deity. He existed as the Word in eternity. The very, you made my point. He is speaking there as the Word before He became flesh. Does the Word then, before He became flesh, say to the Father that you are the only true God? Certainly. Of course. Okay, and with that, we will wrap it up this week. <laughs> they all again. share the same nature. And we'll come back, and uh, thanks, gentlemen, for this week. Please join us again next week.
Tonight, John Ankerberg will examine the doctrine of the Trinity. Is it a false belief? Unitarians, Jehovah's Witnesses, Armstrongites, Mormons, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, and Jews deny it. Christians affirm it. But what is the evidence that within the nature of the one eternal God, there are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Two scholars from the United Pentecostal Church International will argue that the doctrine of the Trinity was created by theologians 400 years after Christ, that they invented it from pagan mythology, and that it was wrongly inserted into Christian teaching. Representing this position from the United Pentecostal Church International is Dr. Nathaniel Urshan, the general superintendent of their denomination and one of the main speakers for their Harvest Time radio broadcast. Also, Mr. Robert Sabin, president and professor of the Apostolic Bible Institute of St. Paul, Minnesota. We do not believe in a three-person trinity. We believe that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. We do not believe that the terms Trinity, God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, the Eternal Son, the first, second, third persons in the Trinity are either scriptural nor correct. We believe the doctrine of the Trinity was a product of pagan mythology and Grecian philosophy. And since this particular issue is pertinent to virtually every Christian sect and denomination, I think this discussion should be of great value to everybody. The teaching of the United Pentecostal Church International is sometimes referred to as Jesus-only teaching because they claim Jesus is the one and only person who exists, who at another time was the Father, and who at another time was the Holy Spirit. They do not believe in three separate personalities in the Godhead, but rather in three offices which are filled by only one person. Orthodox Christianity has always denied the oneness view. In this program, Dr. Walter Martin, director of the Christian Research Institute of California, and Mr. Calvin Beisner, author of the book, God in Three Persons, will present and defend the Orthodox Christian position. When I called you a non-Christian cult, I didn't originate the category. The category came about through the Assemblies of God and the Pentecostal churches, which excommunicated your group because they said you were teaching things contrary to the Word of God. The United Pentecostal Church sets itself up as the judge of all churches. It maintains that unless you are baptized in the name of Jesus, you are baptized by immersion, you speak in tongues as evidence, uh, initial evidence of salvation, and you, and, you don't, and you reject the Christian doctrine of the Trinity in favor of the oneness doctrine, you are going to hell. You have now gotten rid of every Christian denomination, every Christian scholar, out goes anybody who disagrees with your position, and you don't think that this is cultic behavior? In programs one through three, both sides comment on the verses in the New Testament that are used to teach the doctrine of the Trinity. In programs four, five, and six, verses in the Old Testament are examined. In program seven, what does church history reveal concerning the doctrine of the Trinity? Did the church fathers believe the Bible revealed this truth, or did they invent the doctrine? In program eight, what is the relationship of baptism to salvation? In programs 9 and 10, is belief in Christ enough for salvation? Or does one need to believe, be baptized, and come forth speaking in tongues as the United Pentecostal Church International claims? Please join us. And uh, for those of you that just joined us this week, we're talking about the nature of God. Down through the years, the creeds have suggested that the nature of God is that He is a triunity. And uh, that point is at issue tonight. And maybe, Walter, you can start us off by telling how this program came together because there were some uh, challenges back and forth and uh, that helped bring both parties together so we could uh, talk about these uh, differences tonight. But, uh, gentlemen, in your remarks, I know that none of you pretend to be a Greek or Hebrew scholar, okay? And uh, in this topic, because we are relating to Scripture and the doctrine of God and other doctrines tonight, I want you to stick to the facts, stick to Scripture, and because the standard authorities apply to everybody, feel free to quote those authorities tonight. We will expect that information from you. And, uh, but first, uh, Walter, why don't you tell us how maybe this came about tonight? You will be talking from a point of defending the doctrine of the Trinity. And then uh, our other gentlemen will give us their definition. We'll be off and rolling here. I think the, <coughs> excuse me, I think the program uh, came about essentially because of my program, The Bible Answer Man, 
uh, in which I receive a number of calls and the Christian Research Institute a number of inquiries about the United Pentecostal Church. Also, when I lectured, uh, United Pentecostals would frequently show up outside the churches and pick at my meetings. And as a result of that, people kept asking me, what is the difference? So uh, I answered on the uh, uh, radio that uh, I would define United Pentecostalism as the Pentecostals initially had as a cult and uh, did not consider it to be Christian theology, particularly relative to the Trinity, the person and nature of our Lord, and uh, their doctrine on baptism and speaking in tongues. And uh, as a result of that, uh, a storm came in over the radio from different people asking questions. And uh, then um, a Pentecostal minister called in and challenged me to debate. I said, I don't debate generally, but if you have a designated representative for the denomination, I said, I think we could have a very profitable discussion because I think that ought to be done. And uh, as a result of that, I believe uh, Mr. Urshans uh, contacted us and uh, we responded by saying, yes, we would be happy to meet, and you provided the platform. Okay, I'm going to start with the scripture verse that uh, brings in uh, this point, John chapter 8, verse 16, 17, and 18. If you'd like to take a look at that, and it says, uh, but if I do judge, Jesus talking here, my decisions are right, because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me, in your own law, it is written that the testimony of two men is valid. I am one who testifies for myself. My other witness is the one who sent me, the Father. Now, at this point, uh, we would like to have some feedback off of this data that we have from Scripture. Who would like to start us off tonight? Good. A little louder. Cal, why don't you try it? All right, uh, it seems pretty clear to me if the Father sent him uh, and is a witness other than he, then there must be a personal distinction there. And uh, uh, that uh, seems awfully clear on the very surface of the text. Okay, set the debate for some people that have just tuned in and have not heard the uh, preceding week. So what is the point at issue here? Uh, start sure. off maybe with a, a clear definition again. Sure. The point at issue is not whether there is more than one God. We're agreed that there's only one God. The point at issue is not whether the Father is God or whether the Son is God or whether the Holy Spirit is God. We are agreed that the Father is God and the Son is God and the Holy Spirit is God. The point at issue is whether the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are distinct persons. And what we see here in the text is a clear distinction between the Father and the Son, where the, uh, the, the Son actually says that it is not that he uh, bears witness of his, himself all alone, but he has another witness who is not himself. And it is the testimony of two witnesses. That other witness is the Father who sent the Son. Okay. John 14, 10, Jesus said, The Father that dwelleth in me doeth the works. Colossians 1, 19, 2, 9 tells us that all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in Christ bodily. So he was a man born at Bethlehem as a man Born at Bethlehem, he had a capacity, he had an identity, he was a human being, he was a witness. Also in him was the Almighty God in fullness. The Bible says that God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, two, in verse 17, the testimony of two men is true. We do not deny the word two. The question is two what? Two men? Obviously not. The Father's not a man. What do you say it is? The Son is not a man. There are in Christ two capacities, two genders, divine and human. And Dr. Martin will point this out too. He'll say that in Christ is the divine logos with an identity, with a personality, and in Christ is the human being born at Bethlehem. And I don't think he can tell us how those two can be fused into one, nor can I. I want to. Well, let's make sure we know that. what you're saying here first. I'm, the two I'm what? saying that, that in Christ is the human being born at Bethlehem. So and you have the a being. Father that dwell, dwelleth in him. The Father two beings? In him. Two uh, capacities, two personalities, two genders. Two personalities? Divine, two divine and human. Divine and human. No, let me, let me no, make I won't sure say before two anybody. No, yeah, I won't say two personalities. You don't want to say two personalities. No, there's two genders. Divine and human. Two, two genders? genders? That's right. 
the divine gender. Gender, gender is sexual difference. Well, uh, what you, do you mean? It doesn't, I'm not referring to sexual difference, and gender doesn't refer to only sexual gender uh, difference, but Nathaniel class, helped, class of existence. Uh, God is divine, is spirit, and existed throughout the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is a man. Now, you can't tell me that the man Christ is identical in, uh, in his makeup as the divine being that created the world. So what you're saying then is that when Jesus here in John 8 says that it's not that I alone bear witness of myself, but the <coughs> Father also bears witness of me, that he is making a distinction between his human nature and his divine nature as the Father. Is that Absolutely. what you believe? Absolutely. The Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Absolutely. From where? He sent the Son that was born at Bethlehem That's to be the Savior of the world. That's an interpretation. It doesn't say that. It says, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the what world. What are you talking about? You know, uh, this is in First John. You and I were talking it? earlier, when you and I were talking earlier on the subject of the existence of Christ as a person before he entered the world. Not as the Son, all right, but as the Word. I qu quoted a passage. We never got back to it, and right now is the time to do it. Philippians chapter 2. Could you turn to that? Philippians chapter 2. This one has no grammatical answer of any way that I've ever read in any commentary or with any scholar. And I've talked to uh, oneness people and Sibelians and of different persuasions through the years. Nobody has ever come up with one, so I'll be fascinated if you've got one now. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not think it robbery or something to be grasped at to be equal with God but emptied himself and took upon himself the form of a slave. And having been found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. What's significant here is the participle, who existing in the form of God. Your grammar books tell you that the participle, huparkon, means that this is a continuous existence. In other words, he existed in the form of God and then entered the world, according to Philippians 2, in the form of man. Now, I would like an explanation of how he can exist in the very nature of God and then come into the world as a man unless before he was a person. All right, let's uh, look at verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in, not the Logos, not the Eternal Son, not the second person in the Trinity, but in Christ Jesus. And the name Jesus was given to his mother and father to be attached to the human being. Let this mind be in you, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So it's the when mind. When was it in Christ Jesus? Let me Jesus. finish. Can I finish? When? Okay. Can I All finish? Right. All right. Uh, they said, let the mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the visible appearance, if we could substitute Thayer's definition of God, as he appeared on this earth in the visible, uh, don't, let me finish, and then you can shake your head. Sure. Uh, <laughs> who being in the visible appearance of God, in that, in that mode as a human being here on this earth, he did not grasp after uh, equality with God, with God. The man Jesus did not uh, claim divine prerogatives. He did not uh, go strutting about and say, I'm God Almighty. You can't find a verse where he says, uh, on this earth, walking on this earth, okay, that I'm God let, Almighty. Let him answer the question let me, then. Let me finish. I, I thought you did. Oh, no. No, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. He humbled himself as a man. He washed the disciples' feet, uh, took upon him the form of a servant. That's a, a lowly man. Uh, he could have strutted. He had all sorts of reasons to. What has to. this got to do with uh, the question? <laughs> the question is that it was the Lord Jesus Christ that did not uh, grasp after these divine prerogatives. It was the Lord Jesus Christ born at Bethlehem. It certainly was the Lord Jesus Christ who was born at Bethlehem. Great. And when was the mind in him? It says, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus who, although he existed, now that participle is present there, and you will find in J.B. Lightfoot's commentary, in A.T. Robertson's word pictures, in R.C.H. Lenski, in every critical commentary on the Greek text of this passage that I've ever seen, and it's at least 30 or 40, you will find that that, that requires 
the understanding that it was an existence that was continuing on before and after the events that are then talked about. He emptied himself while he was in the form of God. He remained in the form of God. Right. He emptied himself taking the form of a bond, uh, bond servant and being made in the likeness of men. Incarnation. The mind that was in Christ Jesus right. of humility started before he became a man. But that will the take text a break. Absolutely says requires Christ Jesus. It. Jesus. Well, let's take exactly. a break and we'll come back. Christ we'll Jesus take a break. Hold on to that thought. That's that a heavy one. And we'll come right back. No, certainly back? not. Is it in chapter two, Paul is talking about the Philippians uh, being like-minded to Jesus Christ. He wants them to humble themselves as he humbled himself. Christ humbled himself. And even though he had divine prerogatives, he did not claim those divine prerogatives in a way that would bring personal glory to himself, humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And therefore the Bible says, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee, every human knee would bow and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So that the man, the man who humbled himself, and became obedient unto death is glorified. Now, he wouldn't be telling those men in Philippi that they should emulate the one that came from glory to earth, although we do recognize that the one who came from glory to earth indeed played a humble role here. But we believe he's talking about the man. Okay, Walter? <coughs> you want to make a statement on that? Yeah. Sure. Uh, <coughs> the, the verse itself says that it was while he was existing in the form of God that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, did not think that, uh, that that was something to be clung to, and he emptied himself and took on him the form of a bondservant, the likeness of men. That was the incarnation. That was the humbling event. It's nothing humble for a human being to be a human being. We can be proud, or we can be humble and be human beings. It's humble for God to become a human being and that yes. is the mind of Christ Jesus that is demonstrating humility here. That's the first example that Paul gives of his humility. The second example Paul gives of his humility is when he went to the cross, when he didn't have to. It is a humbling thing for a human being to be a crucified Savior and to become the offscouring of the earth. That is a humbling thing. And but that's passage, what Jesus did. But the, this is the point we keep losing no, all the time. Yeah, the participle. All right. Hoparkon oh. says that Jesus Christ's mind, ex he existed in the form of God and then emptied himself, took upon himself the form of a slave and lived as a man. Now, that's what the Greek text says. That's what more than 40 biblical scholars and exegetes say. That's what all the grammar books say. You are simply putting an interpretation in the passage, Bob, that no Greek scholarship on earth will support nobody. Now please, if you want the interpretation, keep it. But for heaven's sakes, don't say uh, there, that the text says it. It does not there say There is it. scholarship that does support it. I'm not prepared to quote it at this you time. You are not prepared because no, it doesn't but, exist. But let me, I can tell you that right now. I've let been me ask you how, on it. how, Dr. Martin, do you reconcile this thought it not robbery to be equal with God with the scripture in the Old Testament where the Lord says, to whom shall I be equal? Who was back there that was equal with him? Who uh, was that? Again, you're doing the same category not fallacy doing anything. that you did before because you're assuming that we are talking about more than one God when we are not. We're, We're talking not. about one God who is three persons. Let me, Simple you category never, fallacy. You never did answer my question, Dr. Martin, and I feel so lonesome. I thought I did, and let's no. not make you lonesome. <laughs> I want you. Please, please right, answer Daniel. my question. Go ahead. I asked you if you believe this. Incontestably declares that Jehovah himself planned to appear in human form mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, all attributes of God alone. The term mighty is applied to him alone in relation to his You were answered by Cal by pointing well, out exactly verse. There's only one almighty God. There's only one eternal God. One, one, one. One almighty God. One almighty right. eternal God. One. That's the position of the historic Christian church. Well, Jesus. Let me finish now. I'm answering your question. We are not tritheists. 
we do not believe in three separate gods as Islam accuses us of. Now, if you could understand how God was God, you'd be God and you're not. Okay, take so your... we, cannot, we cannot knock the Trinity down by saying we can't <clears throat> understand it, it's incomprehensible, therefore we won't believe it. You can't understand nuclear fission. It's incomprehensible, but you better believe it. The term mighty is applied to him alone in relation to deity is in itself indicative of Jehovah, since not only is he the only God... I agree. We agree. We agree. Okay. Then, I am he which was, and which is, and which is to come. The Almighty One. The Almighty. Agreed. That's Jesus. Jehovah God. Jehovah God. Jesus said You that. said Jehovah. Yes. I'm quoting you. Yes. It's Jehovah which God. Which means that Jesus is God, which we believe. Right. We believe Does it. Je is Jehovah Jesus? Yes. Yes. Well, what does this mean? See what uh, our problem, uh, let me show you, our problem is this. Uh, your problem your is that you've got another person. No, no, your, pro <laughs> your problem is this, and my problem is this, okay? We have a linguistic barrier we're trying to get over, and the linguistic barrier is how can there be threeness and oneness at the same time? How can and there Bob, be? All right, now that's the question, yeah. okay? Now, Bob has been saying we ought to go to the Old Testament and see what the character of God is there. We began in the New Testament because it is the basic law of hermeneutics that you always interpret the Old Testament in the light of the New Testament because the New Testament is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. After you lay a foundation in the New Testament exegetically, then you may proceed to the Old Testament to discuss it, but not before you do that. All right, now we, we've, we both we've know got that. one minute left here. Let's have comments Jesus, on both sides. Let's wrap let's it up Let's get here. Philippians wrapped up here. All right, wrap it up. Let me okay, say go that. ahead. Jesus opened the, the understanding of the disciples right. from the Old Testament. But... That was before the cross, before he was teaching his entire ministry, and after the resurrection, he goes back and says, here it is. He begins at Moses and the prophets and ends with what? The resurrection. Here I am. The new creation in Christ Jesus. That's where we're at right now. We're not in the Old Testament. Right. We're in the New Testament. That's going to be it for this week, gentlemen, and uh, we'll continue this. Uh, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week. Tonight, John Ankerberg will examine the doctrine of the Trinity. Is it a false belief? Unitarians, Jehovah's Witnesses, Armstrongites, Mormons, Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, and Jews deny it. Christians affirm it. But what is the evidence that within the nature of the one eternal God, there are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Two scholars from the United Pentecostal Church International will argue that the doctrine of the Trinity was created by theologians 400 years after Christ, that they invented it from pagan mythology, and that it was wrongly inserted into Christian teaching. Representing this position from the United Pentecostal Church International is Dr. Nathaniel Urshan, the general superintendent of their denomination and one of the main speakers for their Harvest Time radio broadcast. Also, Mr. Robert Sabin, president and professor of the Apostolic Bible Institute of St. Paul, Minnesota. We do not believe in a three-person trinity. We believe that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. We do not believe that the terms Trinity, God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Ghost, the Eternal Son, the first, second, third persons in the Trinity are either scriptural nor correct. We believe the doctrine of the Trinity was a product of pagan mythology and Grecian philosophy. And since this particular issue is pertinent to virtually every Christian sect and denomination, I think this discussion should be of great value to everybody. The teaching of the United Pentecostal Church International is sometimes referred to as Jesus-only teaching because they claim Jesus is the one and only person who exists, who at another time was the Father, and who at another time was the Holy Spirit. They do not believe in three separate personalities in the Godhead, but rather in three offices which are filled by only one person. Orthodox Christianity has always denied the oneness view. In this program, Dr. Walter Martin, director of the Christian Research Institute of California, and Mr. Calvin Beisner, author of the book, God in Three Persons, will present and defend the Orthodox Christian position. When I called you a non-Christian cult, I didn't originate the category. The category came about through the Assemblies of God and the Pentecostal churches, which excommunicated your group because they said you were teaching things contrary to the Word of God. The United Pentecostal Church sets itself up as the judge of all churches. It maintains that unless you are baptized in the name of Jesus, 
You are baptized by immersion. You speak in tongues as evidence, uh, initial evidence of salvation. And you, and, you don't, and you reject the Christian doctrine of the Trinity in favor of the oneness doctrine, you are going to hell. You have now gotten rid of every Christian denomination, every Christian scholar, out goes anybody who disagrees with your position, and you don't think that this is cultic behavior? In programs one through three, both sides comment on the verses in the New Testament that are used to teach the doctrine of the Trinity. In programs 4, 5, and 6, verses in the Old Testament are examined. In program 7, what does church history reveal concerning the doctrine of the Trinity? Did the church fathers believe the Bible revealed this truth, or did they invent the doctrine? In program 8, what is the relationship of baptism to salvation? In programs 9 and 10, is belief in Christ enough for salvation? Or does one need to believe, be baptized, and come forth speaking in tongues as the United Pentecostal Church International claims? Please join us. We're glad that you have joined us tonight. And right now, I would like to come to Cal and to Dr. Martin in terms of the Old Testament. And uh, I think the uh, question of Isaiah 9, 6 has come up. I think you ought to use that as a jumping off point. And then tell us how you see the doctrine of the Trinity as relating to what is said in the Old Testament. I think we have to recognize that we basically interpret the Old Testament in the light of the New Testament because the New Testament is the fulfillment. I think we're agreed on that. But we should go back into the Old Testament using the New Testament and examine the evidence. Isaiah chapter 9 was a passage which was brought to our attention by uh, Mr. Urshan. And uh, uh, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall rest upon his shoulder. His name shall be called <coughs> Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, El Gibor, Father of Eternity, Prince of Peace. Of his kingdom there shall be no end. The church's historic view on this is that it refers to the Lord Jesus Christ, identifying him as Messiah of Israel and uniquely as deity. So we may disagree in the concept of persons in the Trinity, but we are agreed that we are talking about deity and that Jesus Christ is the mighty God. Is there a God beside me? Yea, I know not any. And again and again, I am he. Before me there was no God formed. Neither shall be after me. I, even I am the Lord. Beside me and if pronouns mean anything, if the language means anything, if pronouns mean something in the New Testament, what do these pronouns mean? Good there question. is no God beside All right, good question. Let's have a response. In the 19th century, there was a man in Ireland who was on trial for murder. And he told the judge, Your Honor, I can bring 50 people who didn't see me do it. And obviously it had no impact whatsoever on the judge because a negative testimony has nothing to do with the evidence. It's an argument from silence. He can refer to all the, you know, the passages he needs to that talk in single, uh, singular pronouns, and they don't erase a single passage that occurs in plural pronouns. The singular pronoun passages testify to the fact that there's only one God. The plural pronoun passages testify to the, to the, uh, the plurality of persons within this one God. So you're saying that's what the evidence shows, and you're dealing with the one, you need to deal with the plural. Sure. Yes, you also have, you also have uh, to remember that uh, there is a concept in the Old Testament of composite unity apart from solitary unity. You do have affirmations of solitary uni unity in some passages, and you have affirmations of composite unity in other passages. And I think that you have to balance those off rather than to just say, well, uh, there's no meaning to composite unity. I think there is. Yeah, I think also, by the way, uh, Bob uh, referred to the Isaiah 48 passage as prophetic and explained that, uh, that uh, the distinction here comes only after the, uh, after the incarnation, that this is a prophetic statement as if this were what Jesus would be saying after the incarnation. But it is the very person who, sa who says, the Lord and his spirit has sent me, who also says, I have, excuse me, who also says, I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. That person is eternal. The distinction that you see between that person and the Lord God and his spirit who sent that person 
goes before the incarnation, and it's there in the text. It can't be denied. You've got to see what's in the text. In the beginning was the Word. I have spoken, says this passage, in the beginning, or the, from that, the beginning. That distinction in persons is voiced right at the very beginning of the Scripture when God says, let us make man in our image, Why didn't the after Jews pick our it up? likeness. Why didn't the Jews pick it up? Why didn't they worship a God in Trinity? Why were they so monotheistic, and were they a cult? Our capacity to understand who he is, what he does, how he thinks, is extremely limited. We are limited mortals and sinful people. We're limited so to what he has revealed about himself. We're limited himself. to what he has revealed in himself. And if we're really going to learn about him, then we have to begin with the idea that we have to be teachable, that there are things that are sacred, that we just can't bandy around and, and, and kick off and just say, well, we're not going to uh, deal with that issue. The issue is real, and here's the issue, that there is plurality in the Old Testament passages which have to be explained. The Jews didn't understand some of these things. They didn't even understand their own Messiah. They didn't understand that he was God incarnate, which, of course, you say and we say. They didn't understand that. Is there any wonder that they wouldn't understand passages and things in the Old Testament which describe the nature and character of God? You, uh, you quoted three scriptures in the Old Testament where there's plurality. There are thousands that there is unity. Doesn't, don't they need to be explained? Well, Those thousands, and they're not dismissed by simply saying that God I'm not who is composite, and, he, and the composite God can say, me, mine, and, and speak of himself in the first person plural. The composite God, can the, can the Trinity in a sort of a trio say, I am the Lord. Beside me there's no God. Who's talking there? The Father? Who's talking? <laughs> Who is? When they use a personal pl pronoun that is singular, it refers to God in his essence or in but his who's substance, speaking? the who's single speaking? being. Who is speaking? Certain passages, you know, give me a specific passage, passage, and I'll tell you whether it can be Isaiah 44, 24, I spread that abroad that the earth by myself. Is that the Father speaking? Okay. Is it I would the Son say, speaking? I'd say that that is a passage that has to be referred to the being of God in itself. Can right. the being of God speak as a composite unity I don't and see say, why not. I, all through the me, Old Testament. mine? Then, if that be so, if any three people can, can, can say, oh, no, not any three me, people. mine, well, what's the difference? No, it's, it's a great difference. Tell In us. In Genesis chapter 1, <coughs> let us make is a plural. Let us make. Now, well, let's address you, that. I, I want to address that specifically because uh, if this particular passage uh, has meaning, uh, then, uh, as from a standpoint of Trinity, then we ought to understand it. If it doesn't, then it should be refuted. All right, let's, let's then take Then God Genesis. made man in his own image. Right. Singular. Certainly. And is man a Trinity? No. Why not? Why wouldn't man be three persons? Because the image that's being talked about there is an image of, mor of moral free <clears throat> will, of the distinction between good and evil, you see that picked up in, in Genesis 3, verse 22. You see it picked up again in Colossians, verse 2. You see it picked up again, uh, chapter 2, rather. And uh, I, I'm, I've forgotten another New Testament well, let's, passage. Let's look at but, what the... But does it, doesn't, um, let me, doesn't, no, let's, let me let's, ask let another... Go ahead, oh, let, uh, go ahead, Bob. You go ahead. Well, let me ahead. ask another question from the uh, Old Testament. Well, Nathaniel, please stick with it's, this. It's with it. It's with With, with Genesis say. 1? Yes, it's what okay. we're talking about. I, I think oh, what I think for the audience out <coughs> that are watching is that Walter and Cal are saying that they, from the evidence, have a model that fits both the singularity as well as the plurality that we find in both Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay. Deal with the plurality. All right, I see the model. Walter and Cal are saying that they, from the evidence, have a model that fits both the singularity as well as the plurality that we find in both Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay. Deal with the plurality. All right, I say the model does not in any way fit with the Old Testament. Genesis 1.26, let us make man. Now, the scripture doesn't say there who God is talking to or whether he's talking to anybody. Why didn't the Lord say, let us, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, make man in our image. And then how many persons are involved in the creation? Uh, can three persons be involved in the creation and still one God make us? In the Pentateuch and the half Torahs, uh, the Jews, I would think, would know the Hebrew language. 
I would think they could speak the Hebrew language. And they say the idiomatic way of expressing deliberate, deliberation or the plural of majesty, royal commands being conveyed in the first person plural. Now, the Bible does not say there that God was speaking to anybody. Can we right, stop let, let, right there? Sure. Let's, let's bring this right up. There. Sure. I'm glad you quoted that from the Jewish section there because uh, this plurality of majesty has to be addressed very bluntly grammatically, all right? all right? First of all, you can't find the plurality of majesty. You nor anybody alive can find it in ancient Near East literature before the Christian era. That's number one. You will not find it. You search any literature you want. They'll never find the phrase plurality of majesty. Secondly, Plato. the term itself actually came into existence in the 13th century of the Christian era because kings wanting to rule their subjects with a divine right linked themselves to God and said, you may come into our presence. We, God and ourselves, are reigning. Uh, you may leave us. And they picked this up in the 13th century of the Christian era. Now, we're taking the 13th century human beings, kings, who invented the term plurality of majesty. We're transposing it back into the Old Testament, 2,000 years B.C. or more. And we are saying, at that point, this plurality of majesty explains Genesis chapter 1. Now, you have got to be terribly weak, scholastically, to try and go back from the 13th century A.D. to 2,000 years B.C. and say an English Anglo-Saxon word and phrase is going to explain, let us make. Do you know why the Jews put that in there? I'll tell you why. Because when they were faced with the affirmations of the Christian church on the nature of God, they went to the plurality of majesty, which was invented by kings, and tried to explain away Genesis chapter 1, which was cited as a Trinitarian passage. There is no plurality of majesty. It's an invention. This is the copy of the letter that they sent unto him, unto the king Artaxerxes. Verse 18 of chapter 4 of Ezra. The letter which he sent unto us hath been plainly read before me. Now you, you can say there's no plural of majesty, but that's a king. And he says, us. Now, you can tell me who he's including in the word us, but it has no more weight. just another weight. plural, Bob. It That's has no more plural. weight than... Bob, Bob, look, think for a well, second. Who is he referring Why don't you to? let him Which finish? Who is he referring Which to? 418. 418. 418. The letter was sent to the king, verse 11, Artaxerxes. And he answers, the kings, in verse 17, then sent the king an answer. The letter which he sent unto us hath been plainly read... Before. Was there one you, or two you people there? You cannot cite that as a plurality Were there of one or two people there? It, it doesn't say, and it doesn't say in Genesis Would you assume that there, was a, there were more than one? Look, look what you're doing. You're I'm trying taking, not to do Look what you're doing. You're taking Genesis 126, yeah. uh, let us make man, which is not explained. It does not say let us Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And you're extrapolating into that situation three divine persons well, in the I'm, Godhead I'm, I'm when the Lord says it's not so. No, no, a second. I'm refuting the idea which you just quoted, that Genesis 1 can be explained by the plurality of majesty. Well, it can't. Now, let's go to what can explain okay. it. Okay, obviously, right? the authors of the Pentateuch and Haftorahs do not agree with you. Why? And they understand Why don't Hebrew. they agree with me? They understand Why Hebrew. don't they agree with me? Because they understand Hebrew. The, the Hebrew has nothing to do with plurality of majesty. Well, what's, what's your quote? That uh, the us you made a quote, Bob. Now, you read the quote. I didn't. You quoted me from a Jewish source yeah. that said the plurality of majesty. I just showed What's you. What's your source for that? Let me finish. What's Lisa your source? Archer, one of the greatest living Hebrew scholars, and he has Clearly traced every Archer. single word of it back. Want to give Archer's quote? Nowhere in the pre-Christian Near East, says Archer, do we have any example of the first person plural being used for the first person singular. Therefore, in this case, he's talking about Genesis 126. The, the our must have been intended as a true plural, even though it refers to a single God. If now, you've so, got to have to go, if uh, so. uh, wait a second, now, before go you go if so and leave it, I just want to guess fixed in, the, in the, our mind and the audience's mind. The, the quote you wrote from a Jewish source That's right. is based on an Anglo-Saxon 13th century English word. It doesn't matter. You still have not said that he was speaking to the other persons in I the Trinity. That, it doesn't I'm just say trying that. to show you your sources okay. wrong. Okay, yeah, I, think, I think a good thing for us to do would be who to was he go to, to somebody 
wouldn't you think that somebody who was a direct disciple of the apostles would be in a fairly good position to Let me tell how the apostles well, understood that text? And the person I'm talking about is Barnabas, who in his epistle, chapter 6, wrote, For the scripture says concerning us, while he, he's talking about the Father, that's the context from back, while he speaks to the Son, let us make man after our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the beasts of the air, earth and the fowls of heaven and the fishes of the sea. And the Lord said, On beholding the fair creature man, increase and multiply and re replenish the earth. These things were spoken to the Son. Okay, you're not that is from the, the Bible. epistle of Barnabas, A.D. 100. Read the is the latest it could have possibly Read the been written. On it. More likely in A.D. 75, says John A.T. Robinson, and is redating the New Testament. That was from a, from a disciple of the original apostles. A disciple of Anybody the apostles. Anybody that knows anything about the post-apostolic literature I have knows read that the, the, elucidations, best, by the, the way. best thing that you can say about it is that it contains the possibly genuine mixed with the certainly spirits you cannot rely on. Now, that's you, your opinion. Listen, you that's said. That's your opinion. Listen, the, you the, said that God. Just make sure it's listen, your opinion. You said God could speak as a trinity or he could speak from the persons. Who was speaking when he said, and God said. What is that God there? Is that the Trinity saying, let us make man? What is the God there? And why didn't the Jews pick it up? Right well, in the beginning they, they, of the Bible. <laughs> How did they ever evolve a monotheistic faith? The explanation faith? from a disciple of the apostles is, the, is that it was the Father speaking to the Son. In other words, you accept Barnabas' epistle as uh, being equated with the Word of God. No, I certainly don't. But I do think that an, a, a disciple of the apostles is in a better place to understand Genesis 126 than we are today. And you accept yeah. Barnabas' epistle as being authentically written by Barnabas. I, uh, we don't know no, for sure don't. the name <laughs> of the You're person. You're certain we don't know. <laughs> Just I wouldn't minute. get out on that. Wait a minute. Oh, wait, wait, we wait. do not know the name for sure of the person who wrote That's this. That's right. But we do know the date at which it was From written, at least the latest date, how? which is A.D. 100. How? How is oh, it dated? Goodness gracious. So internally, externally. By, by internal dating, by the fact that it's quoted in other, uh, other epistles of the Apostolic Fathers. But, uh, my goodness. Uh, but you still don't you know read the, the elucidations. You told me to read the elucidations. It's in the elucidations, right here. All right, let's move what, on. What, then, what if, does if let we're... us mean, then, to you? I mean, we're talking about it for us, all right? Let us make man in our image after our likeness means for us that within the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were speaking. Now, let me finish. That's what it means to us, all right? Now, we would like you to tell us what it means to you. I'll tell you as soon as you answer my question. Who is God that says, let us make man? Who is speaking? The, the eternal Father triune son. God. The, Father the, to the, the son. Trinity is speaking. Father to the Son. One of the persons. Is, is, is the speaking Trinity to speaking to also when he uses me? And I, you said that before. Well, look, if you want to get technical on me and I, all right, Zechariah 12.10 says, they shall look upon me. Absolutely. Whom they have pierced. Pierce. Right. Right? Who's the me? Jehovah. No, no who's the me? Jehovah. Well, which and Jehovah? Tells you. Jehovah, if, right? if you look in Zechariah, you can see. They shall look upon me whom they have Absolutely. pierced. Absolutely. They shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. You've got two people in that passage any way you slice it. 